The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everybody. It is Lunch and Learn. It is Wednesday, the 13th of um, May. And uh, as you know from the emails, uh, Richard's going to do a special training today. He's going to be talking about uh, using protocols uh, to help, you know, look at uh, doing what's on a sort of, you know, mapless planning for how you can work with patients remotely that haven't had a map. So these are some some things that he has uh, tried, tested, and, and uh, worked with that I think will be exciting for all of us uh, to learn and see about. So. Richard, without any further uh, delay, and I guess, are, we, are you going to keep people muted until towards the yes. end? Are you going to unmute? Yes. Okay, so it's being recorded. Some people ask about that all the time. Typically, if Richard's doing a special training like this, it's recorded. It'll get posted up on the New Mind YouTube channel as soon as they go through it and clean it all up and make sure it looks good. And then we'll unmute people towards the end for questions. Richard. Okay, so our topic today is mapless home training which sounds like anathema because uh, in the last 20 years uh, we've been doing QEG guided neurofeedback but a lot of people don't know how QEG guided neurofeedback evolved and how our system evolved and um, many people aren't that cognizant of how many other methods besides QEG guided neurofeedback how many other methods of neurofeedback and protocol development are out there and are being used. And so that begs the question, well, why are we using maps? Well, because we think they're the most accurate way, but they also give us a really good idea of pre-post changes in the brain and where the person's starting from. And as I've always said, if you've heard me for the last 20 years, uh, any good pilot can fly a plane in a snowstorm or, uh, or uh, you know, a rain and thunderstorms, uh, but it's always much nicer to have radar. And to me, that's kind of what a map is. Now, um, with that in mind, uh, home training, particularly during COVID, makes it very difficult to get a map. I know, for instance, at our, our clinic, Rai has one person come in one day and she uses all the, all the protocols that are proper. She's got on hospital scrubs and and glasses and um, face mask and she wipes everything down and she maps the person and they have a mask on and she um, cleans up everything she takes off her scrubs throws them in a bask in a you know plastic bag cleans the entire place at, you know and then and then leaves and takes everything home and strips down everything goes in the wash machine just like the people at the hospital so that's how extreme she is and then everything else is done through the home training process. But um, we have been experimenting with mapless training for several years at the New Mind Clinic and exploring it and trying to understand it and looking at the maps. And I haven't shared that because we're planning on utilizing some of that knowledge for a public offering for peak performance training, which is we had planned six years ago. We had a website planned, but we've been putting it off because we're developing all these finer clinical tools and we're about to launch that. Um, so those of you who are interested in doing both clinical and peak performance training will make that known to you when it's done. But this is the approach that we'll be using, but it's very effective clinically uh, as a training method too. So let's uh, get started and jump into it. Uh, as I said, mapping is best, but there are valid alternatives. Just for instance, if you have a sensor at CZ, you would note that theta was high in somebody like this, and that's where theta to beta ratio and attention deficit concepts came from. If you were looking over at the map on the right, you would know that alpha was high and delta was low. That person is not getting sleep for a long time, and their foggy brain, they may be depressed. If you have two sensors on at C3, C4, you could even see the symmetry and say, whoa, this person is very likely depressed. Uh, they've got a lot of alpha on the left and uh, they have excess beta on the right. So with sensors, comparing maps with what we're seeing on the tre uh, trend screens, we've learned that you can 
in a lot of ways project what a map looks like if you know how to read a trend screen well. And it's not far out, it's often quite accurate. Uh, the only weak part is that the asymmetries may not be at C3, C4, and the theta may not be that high, or the alpha may not be that high, and that's why it's good to have more locations. Um, the One of the things we have learned from the mapping system is that these protocols that were originally presented by Joel in 2001 from the neurofeedback peer review literature uh, as valid protocols that generally worked with attention deficit, seizure disorder, tick disorders, anxiety, depression, OCD, insomnia, that these had been shown in small studies to work, small empirical studies. Our MAP system keeps supporting these, and these are the basis, uh, part of the basis for our protocols. This was the Othmer's early work also. That is the basis. For, so we're using standard neurofeedback and not Z-score and all the other exotic things. We have just uh, really integrated it in a way that makes it much more powerful. Um, but you can just, for instance, see uh, anxiety O2. They are training alpha up and beta down at O2. Well, that's our, if you look at most people who have mostly just anxiety, um, uh, beta asymmetry in the uh, in the map, and they have report mostly anxiety on the ISI, you'll see that the map generally puts them back at 0102 or sometimes P3, P4. And if you look at it statistically, that is the case. Uh, attention deficit, it's usually driving you to C3, C4 or FP1, FP2. Um, and those are the sites, uh, you know, even FZ sometimes. In those days, they didn't do FP1, FP2. But the map doesn't know that. And that's what we, it supports this protocol. Uh, depression, you'll often find the map most of the time puts you in the front at F3, F4, sometimes F7, F8, FP1, FP2, but generally F3, F4. So the MAP system over the last 10 years has validated and confirmed our protocols and the basis here it is for our protocols. So yeah, we take maps, but how do people get protocols from maps? Um, well, you, people don't always get protocols from maps. Uh, actually, New Mind is one of the few people that does it, and Thatcher is one of the few people that does it. Now, Thatcher uses a way more complex methodology, and uh, I think more controversial because there's not a lot of actual research on it. Whether he's right or wrong, we're going to find out. Um, if he's right, it'll be amazing and very interesting. Um, got a lot of research behind it but it's very complex uh, software. So um, you can do neurometric QEG analysis or Z-score like BrainMaster. I mean, they don't really base their uh, their protocols off a map. You know, BrainMaster concept is just train the brain to Z, uh, to the Z-score norm as much as you can. And Tom has come up with very sophisticated software to do that without overly constraining the brain. So they're not tied to one protocol. Um, then there's a lot of people out there looking at a brain map and saying, well, anatomically this person has bad short-term memory that should be anatomically dorsolateral, F3, F4, or F7, F8. Let's look at the map. Oh yeah, that area looks bad. Let's train there. Other people, they just use DSM categories, which was what we saw here. You have DSM categories and a, and a one-size-fits-all. Um, then you have other people who use symptom reports. That was more like the early Othmer. If you had a symptom, you trained there, you couldn't sleep, you trained here. Um, you, you know, you were grinding your teeth at night, you trained there. You had problems with urine uh, or attention, you trained here. You know, you had depression, you trained there. Uh, so that was, and um, that's still going on a lot out there in neurofeedback land. And then, Assessment analysis, which is more of something that we've been developing, and so I want to focus on that. You can utilize assessments to direct protocols very effectively, and that's what we've been learning because we have standardized protocols based on peer review and assessments based upon statistical analysis and peer review uh, literature that we can look at the relationship between assessments, 
maps, and protocols, and we've learned that you can use assessment to drive protocol very effectively. So that's a major eye-opening thing. So st these are statistically based um, on symptoms. Uh, they're correlated with peer review. They're based on statistical correlations that we've done in the mapping system, and they can be symptom-driven. So it kind of contains all of these previous things in one approach. So assessments uh, can be used to evaluate emotional, cognitive, and sensory integration status. These are major dimensions of neural, neuronal dysregulation. The interactive self-inventory looks at socio-emotional, and, um, and the computerized performance tests look at cognitive functions. So we have the, those are very empirically based. They're based upon research, based on statistical development. Uh, it's all published stuff. We know they're very accurate. The cognitive emotional checklist is statistically based, um, and it gives us the person's personal experience of what's going on and a probability based on that of how accurate that is. So using all three, you can triangulate. Now, the new mind database finding comparing the assessments, the ISI, CEC, and CPT, with the protocol generation output, if you start looking at that, in terms of correlations, what you're going to find, and a lot of you know have reported that to me and told me that, you say, hey, I noticed. And yes, you are noticing it. Depressed individuals tend to end up with protocols at F3, F4. Anxiety individuals end up uh, training often at O102. People with emotional integration, stability, and sleep issues end up often training at T3, T4. Sensory integration is clearly a P3, P4 issue, 70% correlated statistically. Cognitive memory, verbal integrations, FP1, FP2. We've done some statistical analysis on that too. So that should get your wheels turning. The missing piece here, um, which the maps often provide, is protocol sequence, because the maps will look statistically at the worst locations and say, these are the worst places. Use those old standard protocols in two-channel form on those locations, and you'll get better bang. But the assessments can do the same thing. Now, they're not going to be quite as accurate, the map, but they're pretty, pretty darn good. So your clients, depending on whether they have anxiety, depression, or whatever, they may begin at different points in the sequence. If you have somebody who's not depressed, you're not going to start there. You're going to start, they're anxious, you're going to start at 0 and 02. Um, some steps in the sequence may be omitted, you know, so consequently, you can omit that depression. Um, or they may not have you know, a sensory integration issue. Um, right there. So you may skip P3, P4 or FP1, FP2. Um, time spent in each location is based on neurometric analysis, watching your trend screen and symptom report, the symptom tracker. These are powerful quantitative and empirical tools. So stereotypical protocols have emerged. Well, why should we be confident in what I'm presenting? Well, they're based on thousands of maps, actually hundreds of thousands, supported in peer review research findings in neurofeedback, and I'll show you, supported by peer review findings in neuroimaging, and I'll give you some examples, confirmed by thousands of hours of clinical observation, which has come from hundreds of clinics around the United States for over a decade, and guided by statistically validated cognitive and emotional assessment tools, and that goes back to the assessment-driven perspective. So yes, maps are best, but they're not the only way. So what are the caveats for the weak points of home training without maps? It might not be quite as accurate. Well, we won't know until there's more research done. It's likely going to take more sessions because it might not be as accurate, but that's the whole point of home training in any ways. You can do more sessions for less money. Home training involves longer time for symptom changes. Yeah, people may not always sit as quietly as they should. Uh, they may have uh, glitches that they aren't noticing, too much artifact. Um, uh, they may be getting drowsy, um, or they may be eating while they're training. I mean, people screaming around them or running around can involve interfere. So that can make it last longer. Home training does not include the 
physical emotional presence of the clinician, which may account for somewhere between 30 and 50% of the effect of neurofeedback, just as it does in medicine. We cannot uh, underrate the power of the, of the clinician to influence the client, especially their state of integration has a profound effect on the client. And that's been very well documented. So mapless HT pros, it's less expensive for the client. It's less time consuming for both the client and the therapist. The therapist may spend more time initially on sessions, but in the long run, the, th the client's running most of them by themselves. There's less physical contact. It's COVID safe. Um, the client doesn't have to drive to the office. There's less overhead for you. You can do a lot more clients with from home, technically. Uh, it's still highly effective. We know that because we've had lots of people doing it in different forms for 20 years. But more recently, with the new mind system, we're getting extraordinary reports from everybody, from Judy and KK Ray and um, Rob uh, and everybody, how effective it is. And it's very profitable, so you can make a living. And this COVID thing is going to go on for at least two to three years. I mean, that's what all the top people say. If you actually read the top people in the research and not all the garbage in the media. And uh, if you read about the 1918 epidemic, the politician and the media were throwing garbage into the, into the conversation at the same rate they are now. It might even be worse now, but uh, you got to listen to the experts. So how are you going to deal with that? How are you going to deal with these constant waves and openings and closings and the insecurity? Uh, here is a solution, and we have a highly developed system for this, and we're about to put out a dashboard that allows you to watch all your clients at will in real time or at any time and see exactly their status. Um, I think you're going to love it. I know that some of the experts I've shown it to who've been doing this for a while, like Judy and Rob, have just gone like, wow that is really going to make this rock. So your initial challenges will be learning a new format, developing um, novel client management strategies, and Judy and Kehe and Rob and others have, uh, have, and even Jordan, we've all done this a lot, and we are going to be presenting you with strategies and helping you. We'll be here to show you, and we'll be here to start you um, if you're unsure, um, and show you, you know, walk you through the steps. Uh, another issue is selecting appropriate clients. Well, you have the assessments. They're going to tell you how tough these clients are going to be. And if you're not familiar enough yet with our assessments, I think most of the veteran clinicians using our assessments, they can tell you. You look at them, you can tell how tough your client's going to be. You get an idea how long it's going to take um, and what it's going to take. Educating potential prospects. That might be a little tricky, but most of the new people don't know that much about how you've been doing it, so it shouldn't be hard to get them to understand a new way of doing it. We ha already have not found that a problem in our clinic. A lot of people really love the idea. And the people who love the idea are usually people who are sophisticated on the computer um, and uh, they're professionals. And sad to say, but true, it's going to be this professional class that's going to be your future uh, uh, end user because they have the intelligence to understand it. They're going to want to utilize it, and um, they have the resources to do it. And then the initial financial outlay, that could be really big, especially if you're using really expensive systems that are out there. But we're offering you, and if, hopefully you've noticed the presentation on the um, – emails we've been sending out, I think it's uh, three or $400 down payment and $50 a month. You can get yourself quite a bunch of trainer, uh, home trainer systems to start off with and get your people training. And there's a way to do it and do it now and start getting some income now and preparing for what's coming because we're about to run into a, a major depression. And it's going to take at least five to six years to dig out of it. That's what all the economic experts are saying. And it may take up to 10 years to get our employment rates back down to 3.5%. So it's time to settle in, start planning for the long run, and what's what we're doing here at NewMind. So the, the system 
systemic generic training se sequence strategy is this. Stabilize the system and reduce noise. Start training at C3, C4. Reduce inhibitory activity, negative mood tendencies, withdrawal behaviors, F3, F4. That's going to create, as you most of you know, more agitation because people are going to feel more vulnerable and they're going to complain of anxiety. You end up going to O and O2 or someplace back there. Uh, in this case, we're just going to go to O and O2. Um, and then if that's not working well, we're going to shift into alpha, theta, or if it's a kid uh, or somebody who's not a candidate for alpha, theta, we're going to go to P3, P4 to reduce sensory integration problems, which kick out anxiety a lot because it's directly connected to the reticular system. We're going to stabilize movement and improve sleep at T3, T4, and Rob can talk all day about that, and enhance cognitive processing. Uh, and we found that FP1, FP2 is one of the best places for that, whether it's ASD or somebody with TBI. So let's dig in a little deeper. Okay, uh, presented you with a big... 30,000 foot view, but so let's drill down a little deeper. How's it look down in the trees? Okay, we begin with stabilization. C3, C4, protocol number nine. That uh, for five sessions or till you see convergence. So remember here, five sessions or convergence. So using an empirical measure, the five sessions you're going to look at symptom tracking. So using your symptom tracking, uh, qualitative and quantitative measures to triangulate to confirm progress. Uh, uh, this is an initial global assessment time too because you can see is there delta high, is there beta low, is there theta high, and this all tells you important things about what their map will look like. And as you move through each location, you're going to get greater and greater clarity. C3, C4 is the oldest area of the brain. It prepares the brain for pending protocols. We've learned that over decades. The SMR on the right enhances sleep quality, which we need to get working on right away. Um, the beta right hemisphere inhibit reduces muscle tension and, and in the motor strip, helps to calm people. The right hemisphere inhibit uh, beta uh, begins to decrease anxiety. We know that both from the neurofeedback literature and from experience. Left hemisphere beta improves sleep enhancement, uh, sleep onset, and increased activation. You may say, well, where am I getting that from? Oh, let's go all the way back. Uh, there it is. Insomnia, uh, okay, protocol, enhance uh, theta, inhibit beta. And the Othmers enhance beta, inhibited theta. So we found uh, that uh, that does the trick. Okay, number two, train emotional stability before cognitive processing. We've learned that the hard way over 20 years, and the neuroimaging community has been um, crucial in teaching us that. Walter Freeman, 2009, in an overview of what we've learned, said not only should we be using MRI and EEG together for assessment in serious cases, and eventually EEG may be the the best, cheapest way to deliver services, but that we are primarily emotional decision makers. That phylogenetically, the cortex based, it depends on limbic stability because we're emotional decision makers. It can't function well without that stability. And Goleman's research on emotional intelligence tells us the same thing. So it's, it's a multidisciplinary conclusion that's emerged since uh, the turn of the century. We know that theta gamma coupling is dependent on good system integration. Theta is limbic, gamma is cortical. Theta gamma coupling is key to generating metastable networks for cognitive processing. Again, theta is limbic, gamma is cortical. Sustained processing requires sustained, stable emotional platform. And uh, I've gone over that for years and, and presented ISNR and written articles about it. So uh, there's the citations. Um, so number two, using the ISI and CEC as guides to action, we're going to go to F3, F4, use protocol number 20, which is a pure asymmetry protocol. We're just balancing beta and alpha left to right. But that's what the research all shows we should do. This is for clients who show up with high ISI depression scores, and hopefully they report depression on their CEC. For the kids, you'll have to 
rely on the CEC depression scores, but those are designed to be like the ISI. They have uh, the same type of dimensional analysis, and they'll tell you if the kid's depressed. Based on uh, asymmetry research, I think Gold et al. 2012 summarizes that best. Um, and I presented that at the meetings. It improves frontal asymmetry. It targets the sub targets the subgeneral anterior cingulate cortex. I mean, Joel Lubar started talking about that in the early 2000s. Um, we all saw it um, effective. Neurofeedback protocol reviewed. Choi et al. showed in a control group design how effective it was. You skip this step if there's no depression, without medication, that is. You know, if they have depression or medication, you still have to do it. If no ISI depression and medicated using, um, used prophylactically. Now, some people uh, have unreported or they underreport their negative moods and you know, two or three sessions just to see if they've got good uh, alpha and beta asymmetry up there. Part three. Okay, we've done our, our sessions at F3, F4. Maybe we had to do more than five to get good beta and alpha asymmetry, good convergence, and some deep, decent compression. Now it's time to go back and deal with the emergent agitation and anxiety because these people are now more integrating. They're uh, agitated. They're more aware of uh, their issues, and they're looking to innovate. They're becoming more creative, more aware. Um, so we're going to do th uh, this by improving posterior asymmetry and increasing right hemisphere alpha properly to channel training, and that comes from uh, uh, peer review protocol, as Lou Barr said. Uh, we're targeting the amygdala because we know Wang et al. told us that in 2012 that that has intense, fast, powerful inputs to the amygdala. Um, if people are non-responsive, they likely have complex emotional trauma. If they're non-responsive uh, and they don't have emotional trauma, but they're just really slow to respond or they're kids and you don't feel like you can do alpha, theta, you're going to move to T3, T4. Uh, so this non-responsive to O102 is a major landmark, a major decision point, and uh, we talked about this a lot uh, over the years. Um, we're going to use eyes open alternatives, which I'll show you in a minute, 4B and 4C. Um, but if it is complex trauma, we're going to go back to the ISI and confirm complex trauma. And we'll see that in the ISI. And we've discussed that a lot, how to look for that. I don't want to get into it here. Um, then we begin alpha theta sessions, typically 30 sessions. The research shows it's decades of good research. We're going to use HRV if we can. And we're going to re monitor sleep quality and crossovers to monitor integration. All three of those together give us a really good measure of integration. If you're really stuck, sleep quality alone is, is maybe the best measure. Then we're going to reassess with the ISI, um, but not necessarily the whole thing. This is peer-reviewed by Scott et al. So maybe we don't do alpha, theta. We go towards um, uh, T3, T4, because they don't seem to be that complex in trauma, but they're kind of a tough case. Um, we're going to uh, monitor with the symptom tracker. This is going to improve their emotional valencing and their emotional integration, their awareness, because this is a key awareness area. It's going to improve semantic memory processing. It's based on peer review MRI, Chen et al, 2015. It's based on peer neurofeedback peer review. It's based on 10 years of clinical observation in hundreds of clinics. It targets the septal hippocampal amygdala complex, the insula, and it targets salience networks and reduces insomnia. Now, why is it important that it targets salience networks if we're dealing with um, non-complex trauma? Well, even with complex trauma, it's important. but T3, T4 is an area where you can access this, the uh, insula. If you go forward towards F7 and 8, it's anterior insula. More T5, T6, it's posterior insula. But that's, that's critical for balancing between the central executive and the default mode. And what we've been learning, if you look at Menon's research, is that with all these disorders, that balance is thrown off. 
and the salience network is not working right because it's being dysregulated by limbic instability. So that brings us back to why we need to do the limbic stuff uh, initially, uh, which we're trying to do through anxiety depression measures, but if we can't, then we have to go straight to the T3, T4. And so we're going to balance that salience network so that we're spending a good amount of time central executive when we need to attend to outside issues and make good social decisions and a good time retreating and uh, thinking about what we're doing and assessing our behavior and that's what our therapists help us learn to do better too. For people who have raging and sociopathy uh, this is more rare, but it does occur. T5, T6 are very good for that. It, uh, we monitor again with the symptom tracker changes. This improves mirror neuron function. This network is connected to the uh, mirror neuron uh, processing, particularly to facial decoding. Uh, it targets uh, occipital parietal limbic networks, calms people down at the reticular uh, 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 system level at the uh, RAS in the brain stem. It targets posterior insula pathways. Uh, this is all based on MRI research and 20 years of clinical observation. Sensory integration, we go out filtering using the CPT and we want to do that before we try to do frontal cognitive training. So for clients with poor Stroop interference scores on the CPT, this is definitely what you're going to want to do. And most of the time if you have poor Stroop interference scores, you're going to see poor posterior coherence um, at P3, P4, and O102, and T5, T6. And we did analysis on that years ago. I reported it. Uh, it's a 70% correlation. We know that that's there. That's why we put the Stroop into the CPT to begin with, because I knew this was coming down the road. Um, so uh, it targets the frontal parietal networks, which is a central executive network. The parietal is a posterior critical input to the frontal dorsal lateral F3, F4, consistent with anatomical research, and we monitor with symptom tracker and filtering um, CPT. So we're going to retest with metrics. We're going to use the ISI and depression measures only in the ISI, because anxiety and depression is one of the best, if not the best, um, a proxy measure of mental health. And I've written about that extensively, and it's peer-reviewed, and it's published, and, and we, you know, so I, I don't want to get into that anymore here. Um, and we can do a whole separate thing on that if we need to. Uh, we're going to retest with the CEC. Some people, in many of the clinics, just use that instead of post maps to show to their clients they find they like that better um, and that could be an important direction to move in the future and we're going to be looking into that we're going to check changes in cognitive function with the CPTs um, and they're going to be likely improved and if cognitive scores are still low we're going to move to frontal training now these are all uh, quantitative empirical measures that are all validated uh, in uh, neuropsychology and uh, they might even be easier to show clients pre-post metrics than maps. Um, for working memory, we're going to go to F7 and 8, monitor with CPT tests, monitor with symptom tracker. This is going to improve short-term and working memory. It's going to enhance mood. Uh, it targets the uh, uncinate fascicular pathway uh, and the anterior insula. And then for people with socio-emotional problems and word retrieval problems, FP1, FP2 for five sessions or convergence again. So we're using uh, uh, neurometric markers, but we're doing them sequentially as we train. So uh, poor scores on list acquisition tests. This is the time when you want to really do the CPTs and look at them carefully, because what you're going to see, what you haven't normed I mean, what you've normed in the limbic structures and stabilized and is left over is going to be the true cognitive deficits. Because a major part of the time, people's cognitive deficits are based on limbic instability and anxiety and depression. And you've got to have noticed that in the maps by now. So once we stabilize that, if we still have cognitive performance problem, then 
Now we're going to start targeting areas more specifically for cognitive performance. So list acquisition test, FP1, FP2, is going to improve that. Train there, retest. Again, empirical measures, neurometric measures. You're going to see the changes. Um, so th this is going to target area 10, a major convergence zone, uh, and the anterior cingulate and the amygdala complex as well. So exceptions to the generic strategy. As always, high amplitude eyes open alpha. That requires a special strategy. Seizure disorder, a special strategy. OCD, a special strategy. Regardless of the brain maps you have on these people, and they're very valuable because they can tell you so much about their condition and their improvement. Even without them, which Sturman never had, um, you can still make very significant improvements using what we've learned are protocols that are pretty independent of the maps. So with alpha greater than 18 microvolts, um, you can train 9 to 11 up and 8 to 9 hertz down. Usually CZ is the best place to start. Or you can do a proportional alpha inhibit with the new proportional training we have on the new mind software. Uh, this typically involves slowed alpha dominant frequency. When I did the statistical analysis, I was surprised. And uh, but it is what it is. This is your busy mind profile. Clients learn to use um, busy mind to block their trauma inputs from the limbic structures. Uh, Ross at Al and Janet Al, I left out her date, but I'll get it in the next presentation. They show that um, training down that high alpha really calms people down because it gets rid of the busy, busy not mind. And it's very well done empirical research and published in peer review. And it's neurofeedback research. OCD, Sherlin and Congito did the best on this, I think. A lot of other people have followed suit, but with more complex um, statements and, and insights, but outside the field of neurofeedback. We need to train along the mid midline frontal. If we see beta spindling and young, you, it's easier to see that without a map. If non-responsive to CZ, train PZ. This targets, targets the cingulate and the basal ganglia, where we know from research um, the key uh, processing problem exists. And you can use home photic unions like the Zion uh, Excel for symptom management. And we've done that with a lot of OCD people, and it's really effective, often more than medication. Seizure disorder, you know the story. Monitor with symptom tracker, use standard sermon protocols, train C3, C4, CZ. You can tell from just putting a sensor at C3 or C4 which side has the highest slow wave activity. So you train on that side of the seizure locus. This is extraordinarily well peer reviewed and it has got 25 or 30 years of high quality outcomes as reported in Sturman and Egner 2006. There's an alternative by Jay Gunkelman that is really cool that for some people really rocks when the Sturman protocol doesn't work and I'm not going to get into that here. Uh, this targets the lamic cortical gating and the basal ganglia as reported by Sturman and Egner in 2006. So let's dive into, in these last few minutes, how we look at this from the neurometric perspective without the map. Now, as you should know at this point from studying, um, the eyes open has a normal distribution. Here it is, and this is Journal of Physics. These, these aren't even neurofeedback people. They could care less what we're doing. Uh, and the eyes close has this bump where the alpha is highest, uh, and then theta, you can see it's higher, and the delta is next, and then beta is way down here at 15 hertz, 20 hertz, you know, it's about, you know, 50, 60 percent of what is going on. And here we have some norms, uh, I think, uh, in frequency, 10 hertz or 6.1, 20. So those are all well known, those norms, those are the same norms that we found in our database and used for our dominant frequency. So you know, we are constantly confirm and update what we're doing. So with that in mind, your eyes open is going to have delta highest, then theta, then alpha, and beta 40 to 50% lower. And here's a good example of that pattern. There's your delta, your theta, your alpha, and your beta. When you look at the 
in training at C3, C4. This is going to be off if they have a problem. Even if the problem's mostly at another place, you're going to see this somewhat off because the standard deviations will be off. Sometimes delta can be down as low as theta, close to theta, and still be okay. Theta can sometimes be down quite a bit more and be okay because there's quite a bit of variance in the actual um, first standard deviation. But you should be getting roughly this pattern, and that's the pattern you want to shoot for up. You may not get there. But that's the direction you want to move in with your compression. First, this stuff will compress down, and then eventually it'll start, as you train more and more, you'll see it fan out and get a better distribution like this. Here's the normal amplitudes. Uh, these are estimates because you'd have to know the standard deviations in detail, and if you're going to do that, you might as well use a map. But this is um, the rough estimates, and we've gone over that, and you can watch uh, the new mind YouTube videos to learn more about that. So you can see here how close they are. So you look at something like this and you know at C3, C4, F3, F4, uh, this theta is at 15 and 20. I mean, gosh, the theta should be at 10 and delta should be uh, at like 12. Uh, well, 15 and 20 is pretty high, so that's not good. That doesn't take a brilliant person to look at the trend screens especially with artifacted EEG, which we put in there, you're getting really good neurometric data there. And you can see the symmetry right here. How good is their symmetry? Activation, well, activation is not looking bad, but that's because the delta and theta are so high. So we'd like to keep that score, but improve the delta and theta. And uh, you can see that can be a little misleading looking at these factors, which is why we're coming up with a, another metric to kind of refine that more. And that's also why you have to look at the trend screen. You can get pretty good numbers and still have things somewhat off. Here's somebody with a low profile. Look at their deltas down at seven. That's way too low. And look at alpha. It's down like at four. This is somebody with low power and a lot of anxiety, which is very common. And we want to get that activation up and get rid of that beta asymmetry. So landmarks for protocol shifts, convergence usually normalizes first, then compression, and then changes in the symptom tracker. So here's how your client usually starts at C3, C4, and, and then you train them for five, six sessions, and you're hoping to get this. Look at that. You can see that difference, right? Look at that delta, theta, and alpha. They're much tighter. They're much more compressed. We're not up at 20 and 15 we're down more around 14 and 12 and there is that pattern delta theta alpha beta pretty nice got good compression pretty good numbers need some more beta asymmetry but that may not be resolved until we go to 0102 which this person is actually at probably for that reason and we're trying to get our activation up the most important change of all is symptoms so you got to use your symptom tracker with home training and that's why in our software they can't train uh, until they fill out their symptom tracker that way you're always tracking their progress and remember people can't remember more than three days back what their emotional status was the research is clear on that it's not all they can't remember but that's what's really pertinent to us and in five sessions you can get symmetry changes like this, which is a real client here, and this was the real report, 80% reduction in five sessions. So some of these clients come in, and you're training um, uh, F3 or F4, you're going to see it slam down. Now, C3, C4 is just getting them ready, making sure they're not too sensitive, getting a sense of the baselines and where they're at. But as you move forward in sessions, you're going to see. And just as um, a reminder, I have to th thank Michael for Desi et al. 2020. He posted it today or yesterday. Um, training has systematic effects, like we've all known and said, and I was kind of shocking to see that Desi was just learning it for the first time, but he proved it with research, but I think we proved it endlessly, empirically. Uh, with the new mind software that you train one frequency all the others respond you're training a system what Desi didn't look at unfortunately was he didn't look at coherence phase and symmetry um, 
which all any dominant frequency and you may train magnitude and may barely change but all those others may change a lot if you're not looking at those and that's why we like the maps they tell us the subtle distributed changes which account for behavioral changes so Desi will catch up sometime in the next five or ten years hope he gets lots of good funding but here we show somebody training right symmetry and convergence and this is a really nice symmetry and convergence and here's a z-score so we use BrainMaster to show that z-score normalizes when you train symmetry and convergence which it should it's a systematic process like Desi's learning okay so that's our story this will be put up on the internet on our YouTube channel in um, a day or two and you can I know I went through it pretty pretty fast but you can sit and go over as many times as you want think about it talk about it willing to ask answer any questions but with this approach knowing what we know after 20 years of studying with QEG assessments and standardized protocols in the new mind system we can say with great confidence and with great research support that this is a very viable very powerful and very effective approach to training <coughs> without a map if you have to do it I'd rather have one but hey you can also this might not be bad you all might learn a lot more and ask me a lot less questions about some things over and over again if you're forced to do it more the old way with these great tools it will really enrich your understanding of neurofeedback so this might not be bad okay I'm gonna open it up for questions or comments okay, and, and while people are open while you're opening it up I'm just gonna uh, say something really quickly uh, one of the things I did about three weeks ago on a Monday here is I talked about doing a similar process but just using one protocol uh, primarily at all the uh, positional sites like C3 C4 T3 T4 and I've done that now with a couple of people completely and a few more that are we're still working with have a few more protocols to go and one of the things I found is exactly what Richard was saying is as I've gone through using the same protocol just to really get data using a, the basic asymmetry protocol which is pretty safe these kids have been able to tell to the clinician at the center I'm working with that one felt really good so in the process of trying some of these different uh, protocols, trying some of these different protocols, what you're going to find is that the patient will say, "Oh, that one, that one really made me feel good." So there's some there's some tremendously good value in what we just saw today. Okay. Any comments, questions? Uh, Richard, I just want to compliment you for uh, your timing, for for bringing this, um, for making this available at such a critical time when it's so it's so um, it's serendipitous, so salient to our global extra personal um, situation, and it's so needed for us to try and synchronize the intrapsychic functioning in a way that we have something to offer clients you know given how broken our healthcare delivery system is um this is just uh just a wonderful thing to do i don't want thank you thanks Vic. uh i just want to say it's very serendipitous i mean we obviously we had no idea this was coming we were just developing home training and developing these concepts and making the observations because we had the data available uh but um, we didn't want to release it until uh, we really had even more data. But and this is a little premature. But uh, you know, when I went over the data and I thought about it, I thought, you know what, the time has come to really put this out there and say, you know, this is what we've been finding, and uh, and get everybody thinking about this out there. All right. Richard, thank you, uh, Richard. Uh, you know that last screen. Uh, um, it's. It's a little out of focus that, um, unless it's my eyes, the right Z score is a little, um, the focus is not very good. Yeah, sorry about that. It's down. This is this is Z. Uh, this is is equal zero. This is um, minus one point five and plus one point five. That's using okay. those uh, parameters, and you can okay. see it's it's close to the zero line. 
Good. Do you have, do you find that the uh, frontal lobes are a little bit more sensitive and they're not often the best place to start training? Yes, uh, absolutely. That's why, why we started C3, C4, because it's the uh, oldest, most least sensitive place, and you never know how sensitive people are going to be. Dr. Suter, yes, uh, I know that you mentioned such as it training at P3, P4, uh, you may mention protocol number 20, but uh, training at other locations like F7, F8, you didn't list any specific protocols. Do we stick with protocol 20 for the rest, or is it just more create as what we see the trend screen shows? I think you should base it on the trend screen when you get to those okay. alternative locations. And you should have enough information by then from all the other locations you've trained to have a pretty good idea of what's going on. Okay, thank you. Great question, Shana. Thanks for asking. Dr. Shooter, are you able to send these PowerPoint slides out to us on the listserv? Um, eventually, uh, maybe. I have to see how big the PDF is, but this will be up on the uh, internet on um, my YouTube channel. Um, but uh, I'll see. Let me see how big the PDF is and we'll look into that. Okay, thank you. Uh, one more question. Uh, it, this may be on the YouTube channel, but. Uh, under high amplitude alpha, proportional alpha inhibit, where is that at? Uh, that's been published on the YouTube channel, yeah. It's up there and okay. it's in it's in our software. We just released it uh, a few weeks back as a as, as one of the key it's one of the key programs I've been waiting for the developers to get out so I could do peak performance training because that's where I've done most of my research with with the proportional training for peak performance. How do I find that in the software? Is oh, it just listed as a protocol or something? No, or? it's hidden so it doesn't confuse people. If you go up to the far right side of the software in the upper right hand corner, you can set the uh, the timing, you know, how uh, uh, the update timing and everything and the artifacting and all of that, how much artifact yes. is. If you go there mm -hmm. under, um, I think it's, uh, does it say tone? I, I'm trying to remember, but if you click on one of those, you'll see it, it drops down, it gives you different tones, and then it gives you proportional. Got it. I think that's where it is at. I have to, or you know, it may be, I may be confusing that with our other new coherence training. But uh, just call Jordan or Jason and ask him, and they'll they'll show you. Thank you, Dr. Suter. That uh, this is Jason. Um, that proportional option is only available with the ninety nine dollar a month uh, pro online software subscription version. That's when they will see it. Great, Jason. Thanks for, for clarifying that. And Jason is, you know, he's in the trenches every day. He knows this stuff good. Okay, any other questions or comments? Uh, Pursuiter, this is Yvette Lample here in Texas. Hey, Yvette. Um, Good to hear from you. I hope you're all safe down there. We, we are. And I just had a kind of a reflection or a comment on how to guide clients using the home training. You know, most of my clients uh, experience complex trauma. So one of the things I've noticed while training, and this was in the office, of course, and we're not doing that right now, um, is that even, you know, any, let's see, the, the video might be, could cause uh, or trigger, yes, right? Yes, absolutely. When I was with complex trauma. And so me being in the room with them, we can pause for a second and we can do mm -hmm. breathing, the diaphragmatic breathing, and then go back to the training. I will be very, you know, careful to pick, um, in at the beginning of training, obviously, videos that will not be triggering because with this clients, even things that will not be triggering for you can be triggered for them, even nature, you know, something that um, that will come up for them that they will become aware of. So I'm thinking in terms of home training with complex trauma, you know, how to also provide some guidance on on what will be the the videos that they might use if you're not with them in the room and, and something gets triggered. That's a really good point, uh, excellent point. And we're gonna have to talk about that more. And we're obviously gonna learn more uh, as we do a lot of this. Um, I have worked with people with complex trauma and uh, one of the important yeah. things is to be present 
uh, during the initial alpha theta sessions online with them, I would be using GoToMeeting, um, and uh, and I could call them on the phone if I needed to if if uh, anything came up. Um, it does take a certain skill set. Uh, you can learn it. Um, you know, people with really severe trauma, I wouldn't do home training with mm -hmm. necessarily, obviously. But you know, what's going to be wonderful is when there's the new piece of software that they're developing that um, will enable you to see the home training session while they're doing it, which changes the picture of everything in terms of being able to intervene if something's going on. So that the, the scope that this is gonna be enlarged to is really gonna be amazing, and I don't think yet we can conceptualize it. Um, the, Richard and the team, everybody's been thinking about how can we make this something that will be almost like they're in the office because I also have concerns about training complex trauma remotely and won't do it without having parameters set up that the client has to meet prior to me doing anything beside some easy stabilizing protocols. So I'm excited for what's coming as well, which how long do you think, Richard, before we uh, get to have that? <coughs> the dashboard. Uh, yeah. uh, I, I I think Sean was aiming at um, uh, four weeks from now, um, something like that. Uh, it might be a little bit longer, but uh, we're pushing it and we're really working on as fast as we can. Um, the beginning of July at the latest, but um, uh, yeah. that's going to that's going to change the scope. I think of what those of us who are concerned about the complex trauma issue, doing it remotely and leaving people at home, so to speak, fair, not, not hanging necessarily, but you know, uh, being able to watch their trainings as they're going on or interact with them, see their training and be able to interact with them, pause it if they need to. I think the, uh, the scope of that will answer some of what you're talking about, Yvette, and I totally am with you on it. Right, right. Well, we're, we're going to all be learning. Yeah, somebody else had a question? That's pretty exciting. I was thinking also that, you know, sorry to interrupt, but even for the very first sessions, like if it's not complex trauma, but a lot of parents want to train their kids, you know, during the summer, they take them off the medications for ADHD, and this is a good time to train for any kids who is, you know, dyslexia. And oh, I will imagine that maybe even using some of the telehealth you know, guiding them on the very first five mm -hmm. sessions just to make sure parents are, are doing this properly, setting up the place for the child properly for training. Yeah, really good points. Well, we're at the top of the hour. I'd love to continue this. We can continue it more on Friday, I think. Um, we don't have anything major going on. We can talk about it some more. It's an exciting uh, topic. It's a vitally important one to all of us. It's It affects whether we can how effectively we can uh, continue on in our practice uh, and, and in what way and make an income and survive the coming economic depression, which is inevitable uh, at our present unemployment rates and small business failure rate. Uh, it's it's going to be uh, a little bit scary, you know, uh, when we get into uh, this coming fall with the economics and the second wave coming. So we have to be prepared for it. We need to go out and try and get my earbuds. What was that, Adrian? Oh, he's just talking. I loud. think it's just a, well, yes, another phone call. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for the very timely information. You're welcome, Carl. Thank Hope you. it's all helpful Thank to all of you. I know it'll get you thinking. Have a great uh, week and we'll get together again on Friday. All right. Bye, everybody. We'll see you Friday. Bye. Thank you. Excellent presentation. Thanks, Lori.